Around the year A.D. 140, a Bible teacher named Marcion rose to prominence in the city of Rome. Marcion's rise was not based on the kind of principles or built on the legacy faithful expositors of Scripture desire. Marcion became well known for his radical new teaching that distinguished between the God found in the New Testament, whom he taught was the true God, and the lesser deity, according to Marcion, that was found in the Old Testament. Marcion, in fact, rejected the entire Old Testament as Scripture. Stating that it was inferior in its theology, it presented an inferior deity. It was consumed with law and destruction, while the New Testament was about a God of love, a God who was purely spirit and holy love, a God worthy of worship. Not the entire New Testament, of course. Marcion rejected most of the New Testament as well, except for ten letters of Paul and one gospel, the gospel of Luke. Marcion had a number of reasons why he created his own very small canon of Scripture, but one of his his key tenets was that God in the Old Testament is a God of wrath, a God of judgment, a God of destruction, a God of jealousy, a vengeful God, and any God who is jealous or who is vengeful is unworthy of worship. We understand these are the basest and, and cruelest parts of humanity. How could we worship a God characterized by such attributes? When Marcion read the Gospel of Luke and ten of the letters of Paul, he thought he found an entirely different God from what he found in the Old Testament, a God who was holy love. Not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy love. Marcion was rightly rejected as a heretic during his lifetime, and the church so vehemently rejected his teachings that none of them have, been survived, to, have survived to this day. They've all been burned, destroyed, and, uh, and there is nothing left of what he has written other than quotes denouncing him and other church fathers. Marcion, though, might be the unofficial and unrecognized patron saint of sentimental evangelical Christianity in contemporary America. While no evangelical today would blatantly reject the Old Testament as Scripture, at least not in profession, it is not uncommon for the Old Testament to be rejected in practice. While we give lip service to the importance and value of all Scripture, we often neglect and devalue the first two-thirds of our Bible. One reason, as we mentioned when we started this study on the Minor Prophets, is because in the Old Testament we see multiple pictures of God's wrath and His indignation, His vengeance and His jealousy. And we prefer to avoid such images of God, such images of an angry God, a God who judges iniquity, transgression, and sin, a God who will take vengeance on His adversaries, a God who is jealous. And so we often find ourselves worshiping a God that we have created rather than the God who created us. One sure antidote to such a lopsided and distorted image of God, such as practical Marcionism paints, is the book of Nahum. If you are rusty on your understanding of the wrath of God, a study of this book will quickly remedy that problem. If you think that God is holy love without any trace of vengeance, anger, jealousy, and the like, this book will disabuse you of that notion rather quickly. The book of Nahum is a blistering denunciation of the Assyrian Empire, and it has its sights set specifically upon the city of Nineveh, the capital of the empire. Now, if you're familiar with the Minor Prophets, as we have become over the past six weeks, we are used to these books beginning with the thunderbolts of divine judgment. But we also expect the calm of mercy and salvation to follow the storm. In Nahum, we experience no such relief. Go to Nahum 3, verse 19. The very last verse of this short book. There is no relief. That could be the summary of the book. There is no relief for your breakdown. Your wound is incurable. All who hear about you will clap their hands over you, for on whom has not your evil passed continually? 
This is not a word of salvation to the recipients of this prophecy. This is a word of woe, a final confirmation that Nineveh is doomed. This final verse is the capstone on an edifice composed entirely of destruction. If we were going to go through this book chapter by chapter this morning, which we won't because we really have to set the context to understand it, this my third point is probably normally an eight-week series this morning. I'll just tell you that. But we're going to have to get through it in one shot. But if I was going to go through the whole book, I would give you this outline. The destruction of Nineveh decreed in chapter 1. The destruction of Nineveh described in chapter 2. And the destruction of Nineveh deserved in chapter 3. You see the theme? The destruction of Nineveh, the destruction of Nineveh, the destruction of Nineveh. Decreed, described, deserved. The book of Nahum heralds divine judgment upon a wicked city and the dissolution of a godless empire. Now, for those of us who have been here for the last few weeks and tracking along with this series on the minor prophets, this might come as a bit of a shock. Because the last time we encountered the city of Nineveh, great things were happening in Nineveh. Jonah had just been in Nineveh, who I momentarily swapped in the Genesis reading this morning with Joseph. Don't know how he got in my brain, but Jonah was in the city of Nineveh, preaching, preaching basically the same message Nahum preached, destruction, doom, judgment, wrath. But Nineveh miraculously repented. And their city was spared. God relented concerning the judgment He said He would bring. This was in the middle of the 8th century B.C., around 750 to 760 B.C. How could we return to the city of Nineveh and find such a different scenario? By the time we come to the book of Nahum, a century has passed since Jonah left Nineveh, since Jonah sat outside the city under his dying plant wishing for its destruction. About a hundred years have come and gone And the residents of Nineveh who had heard Jonah preach were all dead by this time. Most of their children were dead as well, and probably many of their grandchildren were dead. People didn't live very long in ancient warfare states, typically. And so all the residents who understood who the God of Israel was and who repented had had, had perished from the scene. They had disappeared. They had gone to be with the Lord. And we see here the importance of teaching the next generation to know the Lord, don't we? 100 years. And the message that Jonah brought completely lost on the city of Nineveh. And the people had returned to their pagan and godless ways. Something has gone decidedly wrong in this intervening period. Nineveh had grown mightier in power over this time. They had become great in pride and hubris. In fact, they had conquered cities that were previously thought to be impregnable. Cities like Thebes in Egypt, surrounded by water and walls, incapable of devastation, not when the Assyrian army marched south into Egypt and destroyed that city. This was perhaps the height of Assyrian power when they destroyed the city of Thebes in Egypt in 664 B.C. And most scholars agree that the book of Nahum was written shortly after they had destroyed this Egyptian stronghold. And so Nahum's oracle of judgment would have sounded rather strange, impossible, even absurd to most readers. Not only was Nineveh powerful from a military perspective, but the city of Nineveh itself seemed utterly impenetrable. A river ran through the middle of the city, which was good if you ever had a siege come up against you because you couldn't be starved out of your city. The the river provided food, and it provided water, and so the Ninevites could, could outlast any siege army that would come up against them. Moreover, the city of Nineveh was protected by a wall, a 100 foot high wall, a wall that measured 50 feet thick, and a wall that encircled the entire city. I mean, you want to talk about border security, that's a wall, right? 100 feet high, 50 feet thick, all the way around the city. The emperor Sennacherib was so enamored with his defenses, he called the wall surrounding the city the wall whose glory overthrows the enemy. He thought surely nobody would ever be able to penetrate beyond this barrier. How could such a great and mighty city be destroyed? And in point of fact, 
no one to this day knows how Nineveh was destroyed. The city fell in 612 B.C. That much is clear from the annals of the Chaldeans. But how the Babylonians defeated them is not clear. Some say part of the river that went through the city ended up eroding underneath the wall and washed away part of the wall, opening a breach for the Chaldean forces to storm through and destroy the Ninevites. But ultimately, no one knows. What we do know is that the city that seemed unconquerable fell and was never rebuilt. In fact, 300 years later, when the Greeks were on the march through ancient Assyria, they marched over the ruins of the city of Nineveh, and not one soldier even could recognize a city had been there 300 years prior. Utter, complete devastation. In the year 605, the Assyrians tried to rebel one more time against Babylon, only to be defeated and disappear from history forever. When's the last time you met an Assyrian? Same time, probably, as you last met an Edomite. You haven't. They don't exist anymore. God has destroyed them utterly from the face of the earth. Nineveh, the great city that repented at the preaching of Jonah and that ruled the known world of its day, that seemed an unstoppable power, the superpower of the world, was no match for the God of Israel when His wrath was kindled against them. Now, to understand the book of Nahum, then, and the divine decree of destruction that goes out against Nineveh and would be fulfilled a mere 50 years later, we need to understand the opening verses of this book, verses 1 through 8. Nahum 1, 1 through 8 present an avalanche of theology to undergird this message of judgment. In fact, in these eight verses, this short eight verses, we find seven attributes of God, seven actions of God, and one action the Lord emphatically denies that He will ever take, just in these eight verses. Now, I joked with Randy this week that my sermon was going to contain 15 points, and we were going to cover all of these things, and she was as frightened as you are contemplating such a sermon. So your homework is to see... If you can find all seven attributes, all seven actions, and the one thing that God will certainly never do in this passage. I'm going to help you by giving you three of the seven attributes this morning. We're going to just pick three, the three primary ones that Nahum is focused upon, and they're all front-loaded in the prophecy. The book of Nahum literally makes no sense to modern Marcionites who cannot understand God's judgment and conceive of God as nothing but love. And so we need to understand this book. We need to understand who God is as He revealed Himself so ferociously to the prophet Nahum, especially in His attributes that relate to His judgment. We'll look at three of those. First, number one, we'll look at God's jealousy. God's jealousy. We see this in verse 2. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. A jealous God is the Lord. Now, God's jealousy, we we have to admit, presents a special problem in understanding God. I think as a younger believer, no attribute of God was more mysterious to me than His jealousy. Because isn't jealousy a negative attribute? I mean, when's the last time somebody was described as jealous and it was a compliment? Probably not very recently in your experience. You don't normally think of that term as something positive. Jealousy is is to us a character flaw. We tell our children, don't be jealous. You know, their siblings get something they don't get or or whatever. Don't be jealous of your siblings. Be happy that they got something nice. In fact, if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4, we see that it says there, love is not jealous. If God is love, And if love is not jealous, why does Nahum begin his prophecy by saying, first and foremost, straight out of the gate, God is jealous? Can God be love if God is jealous? This is the headline of the book, by the way. Jealous is God. First thing. Now, we need to understand, first of all, that Nahum is not alone in describing God as jealous. He's not the first person to say this. The first person to say this about God was God. And so if you go back to Exodus chapter 20, we find the Ten Commandments. And God is is giving the people of Israel the law, the covenant, now that they have come out of Egypt, now that they have experienced the Exodus. And they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. They are ready to go on the march. God lays down His law. 
And he tells them that they are not to create idols. And they're not to have other gods before him. And they're not to worship these idols. And then verse 5, he says, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This follows the second commandment. Don't make idols. Don't worship idols. Because I am jealous, God says. Now look over at Exodus 34. It gets even more serious. Israel has blown it right out of the, right out of the chute. They make a golden calf for themselves. Just seemingly hours after being told not to make any idols. The first thing they do, make an idol. And so Moses begs God to show him his glory, to have mercy on Israel. And God shows Moses His glory, at least the backside of it, proclaiming His name in Exodus 34. And then in Exodus 34, 14, He reiterates the the, uh, prohibition against idolatry. And He says, For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. This goes beyond an attribute of God. This is the name of God. Jealous is who He is as God. Jealousy is not as prominent in the New Testament when speaking of God, at least not so directly. But it does come up in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. And the phrase godly jealousy in Greek literally reads the jealousy of God. It's not the jealousy of the flesh. It's not a sinful jealousy. It is a godly jealousy because it is a reflection of the nature of God Himself whose name is jealous. Now, as we consider God's jealousy, we have to understand that it is an attribute that is essential to His nature. If He is not jealous, He is not God. But we also have to dissociate God's jealousy from human jealousy. We dare not confuse the two. Human jealousy is routinely condemned in Scripture. It is prohibited over and over and over and over again in the Bible. In Galatians 5.20, it is a work of the flesh. Those who practice jealousy, Paul says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. In James 3.16, it is described as a source of disorder in relationships. It creates all kinds of chaos and disharmony and, and division among people when there's jealousy. How do we make sense of this then? How is God's jealousy different than human jealousy? And the difference is principally this. Human jealousy arises from selfish fears or desires, while divine jealousy arises from holiness and love. Human jealousy comes from selfishness, from fear, from desires we have for ourselves, while God's jealousy arises from His holy nature. If you think about human jealousy for a few minutes, why do people become jealous? Well, one word that is sometimes used in place of the word jealousy in the Bible is the word envy. The word jealousy in in, uh, in Greek can be translated as envy many many times. People get jealous of others because they envy what they have. As finite fallen creatures, we are limited. And we have limited resources and limited time and and all those types of limitations that are on us as creatures. And, And so we are jealous many times of those who surpass us in some area or some skill or some quality that we admire, we wish was our own. People become jealous also because they're afraid of losing what belongs to them. They're afraid of somebody coming and taking what is theirs. We might think of a jealous husband or a jealous wife. Why are they jealous? Well, they're consumed with fear of losing what they love, what belongs to them. They're consumed with lose the fear of losing their, their spouse's affection or attention. Human jealousy often means that we're jealous of someone else because of what they have or because of the fear that they might take what we have, especially in the context of relationships. Now, when we consider God, we we at once have to recognize none of these things apply to God. God can't be jealous for any of these reasons. It's utterly impossible. 
God can't envy what somebody else has that he doesn't have. God envies nobody. There's nobody that God looks at and says, you know, I really wish I could be like him. I really wish I could be like her. I really wish I had those talents, those gifts, those abilities. Why? Because they all come from God. God's created all of those things. God's given all of those things. To think that God envies people or that God could be jealous in in a sense of where he wishes that he was like somebody else is ludicrous. Furthermore, God's never afraid of anything. God fears nothing. He's nervous about nothing. He's never anxious at all. God has never spent one millisecond of all the eternity of existence worrying about the smallest thing. God doesn't fear losing his elect to anyone or anything. We might put it like this, human jealousy usually arises from a deficiency we either have or perceive that we have, while divine jealousy never arises from any deficiency in God because God has no deficiencies. We can't relate to divine jealousy is essentially what I'm saying because our jealousy can never come from a lack of deficiency. When we're jealous, it comes from the flesh. It comes from our own weakness, from our own deficiencies, our own insecurities and pride. As humans, we are jealous of other people. Understand this. God is never jealous of anyone. The Bible never describes God as being jealous of someone or of something. People's jealousy results in anger toward the one against whom they are jealous. Think about country music. Who's the woman always upset at when her husband has gone off and committed adultery? She's always upset at the woman, the other woman, right? The other woman. Because jealousy results in rage toward the person you're jealous against. God's jealousy, get this now, results in anger toward the one he loves. If God is jealous, He is angry with you. He's not jealous of you. He's not angry at the, at the perpetrator. He's jealous, and he's, His anger is directed at the one He loves. God is never jealous of Israel. He is jealous for Israel. And that is an important distinction. God is never jealous of Baal. God's never up in heaven going, man, they're worshiping Baal. I'm so jealous. He gets all the praise. No. No. God is jealous for his people. He's never jealous of Baal. He doesn't want what Baal has. He he doesn't care about Baal at all. Baal is nothing to God. God is jealous for the purity of his people. And so the only way to understand God's jealousy is to understand it in the context of his covenant relationship with his people. God's jealousy then is his unswerving commitment to the purity of his covenant people. It is God's commitment to you as his child, to your purity, to your holiness, to your faithfulness. It is God's zeal to ensure that he is faithful to his people and his people are faithful to him. So when God's people abandon him and worship Baal, God isn't jealous of Baal. He is jealous for his people. He desires their faithfulness to the covenant, not because they love Baal more. and He's so jealous of what Baal gets but because he loves his people. He doesn't want them destroyed by idols. Furthermore, God's jealousy moves him to action. God's jealousy, we ought not to conceive of it as an emotion. Many times when we think of jealousy, we think of something we feel. We feel jealous. God doesn't feel jealous. He is jealous, but that jealousy is a motivation to action. An action that protects the faithfulness and holiness of his own name and of his own people. Now you say, well, why then does God begin with the attribute of jealousy in the book of Nahum? Because isn't, J- isn't Nahum written against Nineveh, not the people of God? Why does God announce his jealousy first and foremost? Well, because unlike Jonah, Nahum didn't take this message to Nineveh. Nahum preached this message in Israel. And what Israel needed to know is that God is jealous for them, which means that all threats to God's 
people's holiness and well-being will be eliminated because of God's jealousy. God has bound himself by covenant to his people, and so any threat to his name or to his people will move him to act in judgment against those who pose the threat. Assyria, you remember, had exiled the northern kingdom of Israel, and now they threaten Judah and the city of Jerusalem, which is an assault on the name of God himself. God is jealous for his holiness. He is zealous to guard what is his. God is not jealous of Assyria. He is jealous for his people, and he will be faithful to his people against all those who seek their harm in his jealousy. These actions then arise out of his jealousy for his name and for us. The Lord is a jealous God, which means, secondly, that he is a God of vengeance. He is a God of vengeance. Verse 2, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. Notice it three times. Three times God is vengeful, avenging, a God of vengeance. In fact, we might say that the theme of the book of Nahum is God's vengeance. God is a God of vengeance. And once again, when we think about revenge, all the same problems with jealousy come crashing down, don't they? I mean, when's the last time you said that person's so vengeful and that was, you know, yeah, go get him. You know, no, being vengeful is a, is a character flaw. It is a weakness in human beings. How can a holy God be a God of vengeance? Well, as with jealousy, one of the things we need to understand is that vengeance is a fundamental attribute of God. Look back at Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verse 1. Psalm 94, 1, the psalmist says, O Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. You see the repetition? God of vengeance, God of vengeance. This is who you are. You are a God who takes revenge. This also finds its way into the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The writer of Hebrews quotes Deuteronomy 32.35, reminding his readers that God is a God of retribution. God is a God of vengeance. God is a God who repays sinners to their face. In fact, Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, was based on the text in Deuteronomy 32, 35. Vengeance belongs to God. And no matter which direction we look in Scripture, we see that God avenges. And we see clearly that we are not to take vengeance. Romans chapter 12. Turn back to Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Very clearly, The Apostle Paul says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Our tendency when we have been wronged, or when someone we love has been wronged, is to want to exact revenge, to want to retaliate, to make the perpetrator pay. But God says, No, do not. Take your own revenge. Do not exact vengeance. Leave all vengeance to God and God alone. Now, as with jealousy, one of the reasons we fail to understand divine vengeance is because we think of vengeance in human terms. Human vengeance is usually vindictive. It arises from selfishness. It carries with it ignorance of what is appropriate when dealing with an offender. You see, if you try to take your own vengeance, you assume that you have a God's eye view of all sin committed against you, and that you know all the variables, all the contingencies, all the motives, all the reasons, all the consequences that should be doled out, that you know all the effects of the evil that was perpetrated against you. Human vengeance is rarely, if ever, concerned with justice. Justice. 
We might think of the strange story in Genesis 34 that we read a couple months ago of Simeon and Levi and Dinah. You remember how the Shechemites had raped Dinah. And Simeon and Levi took it upon themselves to take the sword and kill every male in the city out of revenge. Their father Jacob was not too pleased with their act of vengeance because they went beyond the bounds of justice. But this is human vengeance. Human vengeance never results in divine justice. It only multiplies human sinfulness. Divine vengeance is entirely different. One scholar defined divine vengeance like this. Don't try to write it down. It's too long. Punitive retribution is the sovereign God's punitive retribution is the sovereign king who vindicates his glorious name in a judging and fighting mode while watching over the maintenance of his justice and acting to save his people. In other words, God's vengeance is way more complex than human vengeance. Human vengeance says, I'm going to make you pay. God's vengeance is is well beyond that. God's vengeance is punishes offenders with just retribution, and saves His people for the sake of His holy name. We have to understand that God, when He takes revenge, is doing more than making someone pay. He is saving His people as well. His vengeance has a saving aspect to it. And He does it for the sake of His holy name. Look back at Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 28. This is an oracle against Babylon. The judgment of God against Babylon. And notice what he says in verse 28. There is a sound of fugitives and refugees from the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, vengeance for His temple. Summon many against Babylon, all those who bend the bow. Encamp against her on every side. Let there be no escape. Repay her according to her work, according to all that she has done, so do to her. For she has become arrogant against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Notice the the emphasis on God's holiness at the end. Vengeance is due because God is holy. And this is the reason that God can exact vengeance. When we come to Nahum, then we see this is exactly what the prophet means by God's vengeance. God is going to give Nineveh exactly what they deserve. No more, no less. And God is going to save His people from their oppressors through His vengeance. Now, this helps answer a key question that we often have about the Bible. How can a Christian pray for God to take vengeance on God's enemies and at the same time love our enemies, pray for our enemies, do good to those who hate us? I mean, aren't those things contradictory? Romans 12, 19 says not to take revenge, leave room for the wrath of God. How can we pray for revenge and yet try to do those desires in our hearts for revenge? You know, it's important to note in Romans 12, Paul sees no contradiction between desiring God's vengeance and doing good to your enemies. Because in verses 20 and 21, he says, leave room for the wrath of God, and oh, by the way, do good to those people that you're waiting for God's wrath to fall on. Bless them. Do good to them. Overcome their evil with your good. When we understand the vengeance of God aright, we understand how we can pray for God's vengeance on our enemies, and pray for our enemies within the Christian ethic because we understand the vengeance of God brings about just punishment on His enemies and salvation for His elect. So when we pray for God to save sinners and we pray for God to avenge His holy name, we are not praying two contradictory prayers, but we are praying for the same thing. We must be careful, of course, that we are not seeking vengeance in an ungodly way. Because perhaps we've been personally offended or hurt by someone. We want God to vindicate Himself, His name. How does He do that? Well, He does it by saving some. He does it by condemning others. And when we pray for God to save sinners, we pray for God to vindicate His holy name, we're praying the same thing. God is a God of vengeance. And Nahum is clear that God will exact just punishment on those who refuse to repent and who oppose His holy name. And the punishment comes in the form of God's wrath. Third, God's wrath. 
This attribute of God takes up the rest of these eight verses. And we learn a few things about God's wrath here. I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit these really quick. So if you're taking notes, warm up your pen because it's going to get a workout here over the next few minutes. God's wrath, first of all, comes on his enemies. First thing we learn about God's wrath is it comes on his enemies. Verse 2, he reserves wrath for his enemies. The wrath of God is never reserved for his people. And that is a great comfort for those of us who are in Christ. God is not storing up wrath for us. His wrath will never come upon us if we are in Christ. Romans 8.1 puts it like this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's wrath is reserved for those who oppose Him. Secondly, God's wrath is patient. God's wrath is patient. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. This indicates that God gives people ample time to repent. God's anger is not reactionary. He doesn't fly off the handle. All of a sudden, you know, God's sitting there watching a ball game one minute and he's screaming at the kids the next. No. God is not reactionary. God does not fly off in a fit of rage out of nowhere. God's anger is patient. It is slow. He gives people opportunity to repent, to see their sinfulness, to to analyze and examine their standing before Him and come to their senses and repent. I think one reason we misunderstand God's anger is because we often think of anger as reactionary, right? We, we fail to see that God's anger comes after a long process of allowing people time to repent. I mean, Nineveh had Jonah. They got 40 days. They repented. Now they've had a, another 100 years. And then they would still get 50 more after Nahum had finished writing his book. It's not like God you know, did this in, in two seconds, just turned around and wiped them out. They had years to repent. You think about the Israelites before they came into the promised land. God gave the the Canaanites 430 years to repent before the Israelites came to annihilate them. God's anger does not burst out all of a sudden out of nowhere. He is slow to anger. This is not a fleshly outburst of wrath, but it is deliberate, slow, divine wrath. Third, God's wrath is certain. It's reserved for His enemies. It's patient and it's certain. Notice the Lord, verse 3, will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. No one who dies will escape the wrath of God by accident. You have to understand this now. There are no mistakes on Judgment Day. None. God does not overlook sins. No one will get into heaven based on a clerical error or an oversight. Or God just deciding on the day of judgment, you know? All that judgment stuff I talked about for all those millennia that the earth was, was revolving. Forget it. Just going to leave the guilty unpunished. It's all going to be by the wayside. No, he says here, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. God will not overlook sins. If you do not repent and believe in Christ for forgiveness of sins and righteousness, God is clear that He will judge you. He will condemn you if you do not receive the salvation that He has offered. Fourth, God's wrath is powerful. And we see that in the end of verse 3 all the way down through verse 5. And whirlwind and storm is His way and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of Him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by His presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. This is a picture of divine omnipotence. Even the most enduring and immovable objects in the created world, the mountains and the hills, will dissolve before the presence of God. The entire world, for that matter, will be tossed into chaos when His wrath comes upon it. 
God's wrath is powerful, which makes it, fifthly, unbearable. God's wrath is unbearable. Verse 6, who can stand before his indignation? And the expected answer that you're going to give is no one. Who can endure the burning of his anger? No one. Why? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. God's wrath is unbearable. No one can bear the wrath of God. It is dreadful. It is merciless. It is burning. It is distressing. It is terrifying. It is horrifying. There is nothing more frightening in all the universe than the wrath of Almighty God. Nahum also emphasizes that in verse 6 by using three different words for God's wrath, indignation, anger, and wrath, each of these escalating in fury. God's wrath is unbearable. Sixth, finally, God's wrath is thorough. His wrath is thorough, verse 8, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight, meaning Nineveh, and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. God's wrath is thorough. In other words, God's enemies don't want to bear His wrath. And so they flee. They run. They try to find caves and holes and rocks to cover themselves. They go into darkness and think, I'll hide myself here. God can't find me in the darkness. And here Nahum says, no, God will pursue you. He will find you. He will get you even if you hide yourself in darkness. And He will make a complete end of you. God's not like the Continental Army who gave up chasing the British after a military victory because the British left at midnight and it was 102 degrees in plains of Philadelphia and so they decided no longer to uh, pursue them that day for their own well-being. No, God pursues. You may try to leave your fires burning all night to convince God you're staying in camp while you're heading for the hills, but God is not deceived. And God will not give up the pursuit of His enemies. He will find them every single one and he will pour out his wrath upon them. People don't believe this today. They don't. They think they're going to get an exception. They think that God's wrath is not certain. That God's going to let them off the hook. They think that God's wrath is not thorough. That somehow they're going to escape. They're going to talk their way out of it. They're going to hide. Or they're hiding their sin from God. But Nahum is clear that God is a God of wrath. The wrath of God is not something we like to consider, but it's integral to who God is. John Frame in his Systematic Theology wrote this, In our teaching, the proportion of our references to God's love and to His wrath is not nearly the same as the proportion in Scripture. In the Bible, the Bible talks about God's wrath a lot, especially in that first two-thirds and in the very last book, which is basically just unmitigated bloodshed of the ungodly. There's my summary of Revelation. What's Revelation about? God destroying the wicked. There's more bloodshed in the book of Revelation than the entire 65 books of the Bible before it. But we don't teach it. We don't like to think about it. Why not? Well, one, because we're terrified but also because we fail to appreciate the justice of God's wrath. One writer asked why we find it difficult to comprehend God's wrath, and he answered like this, Is it not because we are only dimly aware of the full gravity of human failure, of the sufferings inflicted by those who revile God's demand for justice? There is a cruelty which pardons, just as there is a pity which punishes. It would be cruel for God not to be a God of wrath. And it is merciful for God to be a God of wrath. It is loving. It is just. God's wrath is a reminder of the heinousness of sin, our sin. Look over at 2 Peter for a minute. 2 Peter chapter 3 deals with the wrath of God coming upon the world and destruction and a fiery ordeal. 
Everything's going to be destroyed, Peter says in verse 10. And look at what he concludes from the wrath of God being poured out on the world in judgment in verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Could it be there's a lack of holiness in the church because there's a lack of appreciation for the wrath of God in the church? When you think about the coming of Christ, the destruction of the universe by the fire of God, melting away all the elements with intense heat. I can't remember what the degree is for the element that melts at the hottest temperature, but it's some ridiculously high. I mean, Phoenix is like a blizzard in the middle of summer compared to what this element can withstand, and it's all going to melt. It's a heat that we can't even conceive. Nahum calls it God's burning anger. The word for wrath in Nahum actually means fire, hot, in its root. And Peter says, when you think about the burning anger of God, the wrath of God, the fire of God, what sort of person should you be? A a sort of, ah, you know, sin, no big deal. Laissez-faire Christianity, I do a few things wrong, I do a few things right, that's okay. Or should you be holy and godly because you see the wrath of God that falls on sin? The wrath of God is a great motivation toward holiness for the people of God, not because we're afraid that God is going to pour out His wrath on us. We saw that the wrath of God is for His enemies, but because we see the horror of sin, the destruction of sin. Nahum has very few words that depart from this theme of divine judgment, but there's a, there's a little oasis in verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. The New Testament does not quote Nahum, but this verse is alluded to in 2 Timothy 2.19 where Paul wrote, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His. Ironically, Nahum's name means comfort. Comfort. You wouldn't think that a prophet that brings this kind of message would have a name like Comfort. We live in a world in rebellion against God, and we live in a created order where spiritual forces of darkness are at war with God, and Nahum comes to the people of God with a word of judgment on their enemies as a word of comfort for them. God is jealous for you, so He won't allow the threats that threaten you ultimately to destroy you. He will not allow these threats to endure. God is an avenger of His holiness And so he will deal out retribution to those who afflict his people. And God is wrathful, so he will punish his enemies. And if you live in this present evil age and you trust this avenging, wrathful, jealous God, know this, he knows you. He knows you. And he is good. He is good. In the day of trouble, he is your mighty fortress. The book of Nahum is a book of comfort for the people of God who face powerful, evil adversaries. It is a book of great hope that evil will not have the last word, but that a righteous and holy God in his holy jealousy will avenge his holy name and vindicate his people. God is good, brothers and sisters. And God is greater than His enemies. Even those spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, God is greater than they are. He will save His people. And He will pursue His enemies into everlasting darkness. I pray this morning that you find refuge in Him. Let's pray.